on it on various aspects of different parameters uh, in a hemogram. And today I shall be concentrating on the um, white blood cell parameters. Next, please. Yeah. Now, infection or inflammation, we all know that leukocytes are the major cellular components of any immune response that happens in the body as a part of protection against infection, be it inflammation, be it malignancy, or any kind of uh, repair that the body has to undergo. Now, WPCs, as we all know, are classified into granulocytes, which includes neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Then we have the lymphocytes and monocytes, which are agranular. Then we have immature granulocytes, that is Ig component, which comprises of promyelocytes, myelocytes, and metamyelocytes. And some analyzers can flag the Ig component, some don't. Now flagging may reduce lab productivity or increase the lab productivity, depending on. So if the analyzer is going to flag out Ig, it will increase the lab productivity because it reduces smear review. But if you don't have an analyzer which can flag off Ig, then it will increase your workload because smear review increases and thus lab productivity decreases. And uh, the WBC count and differential provide a fast initial screening for detection of inflammation and for guiding additional diagnostic procedures or tests. And on the right side, as you can see the tables, it's utility of counts and histograms and flagging. And there are two papers which tell us how it is going to increase or decrease the lab productivity. Next slide, please. Now, immature granulocytes, as I mentioned earlier, includes promyelocytes, myelocytes, and metamyelocytes combined. And usually, any six-part WBC differential, six-part analyzer would pick up these cells. They are virtually absent in normal peripheral blood under normal circumstances. But physiologically, they may be increased in newborns because there's stress when the newborn is born and is transitioning from uh, birth to gradually growing up. Then there are reactive conditions like infection, inflammation, where you have a left shift. You have sepsis, which is extremes of infection, where you have an absolute and relative Ig concentration, which is a very important diagnostic marker for helping the clinicians from a lab perspective. Then the other condition is in cancer patients or in patients where the bone marrow is suppressed, we usually give them GCSF or GMCSF, and that increases the Ig count. And of course, in malignancies, whether it is myeloid, CML, EPML, uh, myeloid neoplasms, or myelofibrosis, you would definitely get an increase. But that increase may stop at promyelocytes or may go on to blast. So the smear review becomes very important, but the importance is of the flagging of the Ig component. Next slide, please. Next slide. So what is sepsis? Sepsis is body's in systematic, systemic inflammatory response to a bacterial infection. It is multi-organ, so it may cause multi-organ dysfunction, can become life-threatening because of a dysregulated immune response to the infection. So unless there is timely treatment given to the patients, it may rapidly lead to tissue damage, organ failure, and even death. So it happens when existing infection, it may be skin, lungs, urinary tract, any focus in the body, it triggers a chain of reactions and is more common in extremes of age. So in under one year of age or over 65 years of age, then people with decreased immune response, where they, they are immunocompromised, it may be uh, chronic diseases like diabetes, 
kidney disease where patients are on dialysis in cancer or chronic lung disease like ILD or fibrosis. So it is very important that early diagnosis is made so patients can be given early treatment. Next slide, please. So laboratory diagnosis of sepsis. Now, we all know there is no single test for the diagnosis of sepsis, but there is a group of tests that help us diagnose sepsis. Now, in 2015, the clinical criteria were suspected or documented infection and an acute increase of more than or two, which is known as the SOFA score. And it's a proxy for organ disinfection. SOFA is sepsis-related organ failure. And there is a score which is given. And today, most of the intensive care units use the SOFA score for laboratory diagnosis of, for the diagnosis of sepsis. Now, in the laboratory, we have a few tests which will help us to know whether there is sepsis or not. Procalcitonin is definitely a marker for bacterial infection, and elevated levels is an indication to start antibiotic treatment. But we must also remember that procalcitonin levels increase after any surgery, after dialysis for at least 48 hours. So that period is very critical whether to take into consideration procal or not. Blood culture is the gold test today, and uh, we have to have blood cultures to detect and confirm a bacterial infection. Lactate is a non-specific biomarker because it indicates tissue oxygenation and organ dysfunction. Blood gases, CRP, metabolic panel, coagulation tests such as FTP, D-dimer, or uh, fibrinogen are corroborative tests which can be used as supportive tests for the diagnosis of sepsis. But I'm going to talk about a simple test known as the CBC, that is complete blood count, which is done day in and day out for all patients who are admitted to any healthcare facility. CBCs are done every day, sometimes twice a day. And the importance of picking up important parameters from the CBC is what is going to help us. Next slide, please. Okay, so the role of CBC in the assessment and diagnosis of sepsis. What are the parameters that we look at in a CBC to help us diagnose or guide the clinician that this patient is going into sepsis? So first, of course, is your absolute WBC count. As we all know over years and ages, that a WBC count, when it increases, it indicates infection. Then we have the neutrophil count, and we all know that also, that neutrophilia is an indication of infection. Then earlier, we used to look at the band count. Even today, we look at the band count, that is uh, bands, which are the cells, which come before it becomes fully segmented neutrophil. And in an infant, the band count is very important indicator of sepsis. Then we have the immature granulocyte count, which is known as the Ig fraction, which today has become very important in the diagnosis of sepsis, and of course, the platelet count. Now, in infections, there are two categories. One is SIRS and one is sepsis. SIRS is systemic inflammatory response syndrome, which occurs before the patient goes into sepsis. So if we can pick up SIRS, guide the clinician that, look, this patient doesn't look good, he's likely to go into sepsis, then the patient, the clinician can start antibiotics in good time and prevent the patient from going into sepsis. So the white blood cell count over 12,000 per cubic millimeter or less than 4,000 per cubic millimeter and or more than 10% band forms is indicative of SIRS when we have to warn the clinician. Then you have the SOFA score, which the clinician has to decide based on the clinical uh, presentation, signs and symptoms of the patient, and the platelet count. These are the parameters which we as a lab professional can guide the clinician. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
Now, before we go ahead, I'm going to actually share with you a few cases because that is what really helps us. So starting with case one, next slide, please. Look at the uh, CBC printout of this case. The WBC count is 42,000, 42.8 42 with a neutrophil count of 35.2. This definitely shows a left shift, flag of left shift, the WBC's leukocytosis, absolute neutrophilia, and the Ig fraction is 8%. So there's distinctly high Ig count, which was confirmed by smear review. The RBC pathology showed, because you can see that the RBC count is 10.9. The MCV was 125, which indicates macrocytosis. The MCH is 40. Uh, obviously, it was a definitive case of macrocytosis. The RDW is very high, which shows that there was a significant amount of anisocytosis. Anisocytosis means variation in the size of the RBCs. The platelet count 126 marginally reduced from 150. Now this is compared with the table which is done manually and it more or less matches segmented neutrophils with 63 but band neutrophils 22 and here it did not give. If you look at the breakup of 2, 4, 6, and 1, 7, it matches more or less with the IG shift. So if we say that we depend only on smear review, here we find that the flags match the smear. Next slide, please. Now we look at the scatter plots that we see on Alanity HQ. On the left-hand side is a normal case. On the right-hand side of the screen is the left shift case. And this is internal complexity scatter. So there are two scatters that we get from Alanity HQ. One is IAS, that is internal complexity. And that gives us the separation of WBCs based on the size. And as you can see, the yellow is the neutrophil, which on the side of the left shift case is totally increased, which shows that there is a lot of variation in expanded neutrophil population. Next slide, please. And the next scatter plot is telling us about PSS. That is, it tells us about the uh, scatter, which depicts nuclear lobularity all fun as a function of the cell size. So nuclear lobularity is PSS scatter and bands and IgGs cause population to be wider and heterogeneous. So this signal is lower than normal, which indicates that there is a lot of variation in the size and the lobularity of the neutrophils. Next slide, please. So this was a case of leukocytosis with left shift immature granulocyte and macrocytosis. This patient was definitely a case of SIRS post-cardiac surgery. We had, uh, from the lab side, we immediately told the cardiac surgeon and the cardiologist that this patient is going to go into sepsis. Please intervene immediately. They told us that the patient had lost a lot of blood. So the macrocytosis was a very reactive macrocytosis. And that uh, they could start uh, higher antibiotics on the patient and we save the patient from going into sepsis. Next slide, please. Now we go to case two. Next, please. Yeah, go on to the next slide. Now, this is a case where we see that, again, the WBC count is normal, low normal. It was only 4.19. But you see that neutrophils, the lymphocytes, and monocytes. What do we see here? The lymphocyte count is high. The variation in lymphocytes. So what flag we got was where limb. So indicating that there is a variation in the lymphocytes. Now, when we look at the IAS plot and the PSS plot, the up and down are the IAS and the PSS plots. We definitely, now here you see light blue is the lymphocytes. 
and the lymphocytes have definitely increased in population. In fact, you can see a dent in the, you like a V at the peak of the WBC, and that indicates that there are two populations of subpopulations of lymphocytes indicating atypical lymphocytes. And if you look at the plot at the bottom, which is size versus polarized side scatter plot, PSS plot, there is an overlap of the lymphocytes and the monocytes. Blue is lymphocytes, the purple is monocytes. And there is an overlap of the population suggesting abnormal cells. And that is why it triggered variation in lymphocytes flag. So the importance of the flagging. So you, when you get a flag on a printout, on the hemogram, when you have the parameters coming on the screen, please take it very seriously. When you have an analyzer, which is capable of giving you six differentials. Next slide, please. So this is a peripheral smear, and it was a case of dengue hemorrhagic fever a viral infection. And if you see the peripheral smear, there were classic plasma cytoid lymphocytes, large atypical lymphocytes. The platelet count was definitely low. Uh, if you remember, it was very low platelet count. And the diagnosis was based on clinical, epidemiological, and laboratory data. Of course, we did the NS1 and the dengue IgG IgM, and it confirmed the diagnosis of dengue. But you know the ELISA test. NS1 is the rapid test, but IgG, IgM, and NS1 is now done by ELISA, and ELISA takes time. So if from a CBC where you have neutropenia, lymphocytosis, atypical lymphocytes, and variation in lymphocytes, you can give out a diagnosis to the clinician that this looks like a viral infection. Let us wait, and these plasma cytoid lymphocytes are classic of dengue fever. It definitely, and you know, a CBC report can be given within a uh, printout can be obtained within half an hour of getting the sample. So if within 45 minutes of getting the sample, you are able to tell the clinician that this looks like dengue, it's probably an atypical viral infection, let us wait, but you can, you know, the clinician can wait on giving antibiotics, they can treat the patient accordingly, and that is where the role of the laboratory is very, very important. Next slide, please. So it was dengue hemorrhagic fever. Next, please, case three. Let's go on to case three and the printout. Okay, now this case three, again, is showing a count of 21.9 WBCs with a left shift flag and an Ig again of 8.69. So you have, you know you've got a leukocytosis, you know you've got a left shift with a high Ig count, and um, the platelet was showing thrombocytosis, but the hemoglobin was low with normal cytic, normal chromic anemia. So the peripheral smear, again, there is a breakup of the peripheral smear in the table below, which who co coincided very well with the printout. So whenever we have a new analyzer, we always like to, you have to validate it. And the only way to validate the differentials on the analyzer is by doing a manual review. And, and when you do about 100 manual reviews, slide review with the printout, it helps us to validate the machine. And here it tallied very well, indicating metamyelocytes and myelocytes with 36% band forms. Next slide, please. The scatter plots, the WPC shows a neutrophil population wider than normal in the IS, IS and PSS scatter plots, and is consistent with the presence of immature granulocytes, and this was a case of sepsis. Again, from the uh, intensive care unit, where the patient was brought from another hospital. See, I work at a hospital which is a tertiary care, multi-speciality hospital, and we get a lot of patients who come from the periphery, from the far off rural areas, where the patients have already been hospitalized, they've already been on treatment, not responding, deteriorating, and then they're transferred to our hospital. So when they come to our hospital, if from the ER we get the CBC sample, by the time the patient is shifted to the intensive care unit, if we can tell the clinician that, look, the Ig count is high, the patient is going to sepsis, please do markers of sepsis and start the patient on high. They immediately start the patient on high antibiotics, send the blood culture, send all the other tests, but 
we have a chance of saving a patient's life. Next slide, please. So this was the patient smear. And as you can see, there is a left shift. You can identify that there is a myelocyte, there are metamyelocytes, there are band forms. And if you can notice vacuoles in the cytoplasm, vacuoles is another sign of patient going into sepsis. So you have toxic granules on one hand, you can get vacuoles in the cytoplasm. And when you have such cells, number one is band neutrophils, which is at the bottom. Number two is a metamyelocyte. And three is a myelocyte, which you can see in the peripheral smear. Next slide, please. So this was a case of sepsis. Next slide, case four. Move on to the next slide, please. Yes. Now this, I want to bring out that a paper was published and a very interesting paper on COVID-19. Now we all know that we've gone through two years of pandemic, COVID-19. We've all become masters of COVID-19 by now, especially laboratory people. We've seen so many CDCs. We've seen so many lab tests over the course of the last two years. But this case particularly drew attention. Next slide, please. Where? Next slide, please. I'll come back to this slide. This was a case of severe COVID-19 infection in a patient with beta thalassemia carrier and severe obesity. Now, because of obesity, the patient was obviously prone to being immunocompromised. And this patient was in the ICU for the longest time. We, in fact, lost hopes that we would ever recover this patient. But God willing, the patient did survive despite the ARDS and despite all that the patient had to battle. The patient had thrombosis, renal failure, required dialysis, had multiple infections, positive blood cultures. With all that, he recovered after more than three months of hospital treatment. Can you imagine the patient was in the hospital for over three months? But what we see in the graph is that the systemic infection, the dysregulated immune response, it needed emergency, went into emergency myelopoiesis in COVID-19, and the hemopoietic system showed promyelocytes, which you can see in the peripheral smear. There were vacuoles, there was toxic granules. But the interesting thing is that the patient's neutrophil count kept remaining high. It did not come down even on day 30. The Ig count, in fact, after day 30 went up, and we were surprised. What is wrong with this patient? But then, because the Ig count went up, we advised them, the clinicians didn't give up hope. They kept on repeating lab parameters and treating the patient. When on day 30, the Ig count went up further, we said, please, we insisted on a blood culture. Next slide, please. And we found that the patient had a positive blood culture on day 33. So day 33, so look at this. Now, day one, the WBC was 3.29, on day 13, 18, and on day 30, 24.3. Nobody would have had hopes for this patient. Neutrophils jumped from 65 to 80% to 77, more or less same on day 13 and 30. The Ig went from 6.4 on day 13 to 11% on day 30. So the two peaks that you see on the left, were because the patient had got a secondary infection. And you can see in the, uh, the myelocyte and the promyelocyte that there are toxic granules in the cytoplasm. So obviously the patient was sitting, the neutrophil went up, lymphocytes came down from 27%, the lymphocytes came down to 3.8 on day 30. So as we all know, what is important in COVID-19 is the NNR, that is neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. And the ratio increased from 2.4 on day 1 to 23.1 on day 30. So with a high Ig jump, with an NLR which is jumped high, WBC count going up, the patient was definitely deteriorating. A positive blood, next slide please. We did a blood culture and we found a patient has grown, um, it was I think uh, Staphylococcus or Streptococcus uh, species. The patient was treated with appropriate antibiotics. And as I said, three months, all multi-organ dysfunction, dialysis, with all that, we sent the patient home after 93 or 94 days. And that was 
very satisfying for all of us in the hospital that we could save a patient with severe COVID-19 and a great, great deal of gratitude to the WBC and six part differential that we were getting from Alanity because without that, we were not able to guide the clinician within half an hour, 45 minutes of getting the CBC sample. Next slide, please. Case five. And this is a very interesting case. This is my last case. Um, this is a case of a normal WBC count with eosinophilia. The eosinophilia was almost 30% confirmed by smear review. Here it is 31%. On the smear review, it was 30%. There were no flags except eosinophilia. Patient was a Middle Eastern, middle-aged woman. And this was a case from Middle East. And because there were no flags, the data was released on the LIS. You know, if you have auto reporting, then if there are no flags, the reports get released on the LIS. But with this, the clinician was a little surprised that, uh, you know, obviously the patient with 30%, we repeated the WBC count after 48 hours. It was still 40, 30-35% uh, eosinophils. Patient had urinary symptoms, but nothing very significant. The cultures were negative. Um, after a lot of investigations, I'll cut it short, we, the patient had a blood cystoscopy of the bladder because of urinary complaints and blood, blood culture, I mean, urine cultures being negative. Urine report was quite normal. So the doctor decided, the urologist decided to do a scopy and you will be surprised. It was a rare case, schistosomiasis studying the urinary bladder, very, very rare case. But it was only because of eosinophilia that we were all scratching our heads, trying to find out. And from the lab side, we were trying to help the clinicians. What can it be? What can it be? Trying to see sinusitis, trying to look at allergies, everything we went through. And last, when we had the cystoscopy, we discovered that this patient had schistosomiasis. Next slide, please. So I think this was one of the rarest of rare cases. Oh yeah, this is the scatter plots. Again, the IS and the PSS. And here you can see the green is the eosinophil. So normal case on the left side. Um, on the right side, you see the green has totally increased. So even just looking at the scatter plots on the analyzer, one glance and the technologist can call the pathologist or the hematologist and say, look, I think this is abnormal. The eosinophils are high. So the scatter plots give us a lot of information. Next slide, please. And the PSS plot, again, indicates segregation of the yellow neutrophils and the green eosinophils. So totally differentiated. So the scatter plot and the um, differential parameters on the analyzer give us a lot of information to the lab personnel. Next slide, please. And this was a rare case of eosinophilia with schistosomiasis in uh, my So that is, I just tried to cover a broad spectrum of what different flags we get from an analyzer and uh, what information we derive. There's a lot more that we can always go on and on. But for the time given to me, this I think was enough to just give you a broad spectrum on what we can decipher what we can do to help the clinicians from the laboratory side and thus gain the confidence of the clinicians for lab perspective. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for being a wonderful audience and thank you organizers and thank you.